Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues from all over the world, welcome. Welcome to this webinar, EPOS, uh, which uh, we're very pleased, uh, Dr. Bidbrook and I, to uh, introduce you. Uh, we uh, at the EPOS uh, Pediatric Trauma um, team thought of discussing today for the next hour two issues with regards to pediatric fractures which uh, are the proximal humerus and the deciduous. These areas of the body uh, have a tremendous potential for remodeling and within our teams and maybe within your teams there are discussions, sometimes lively, sometimes uh, educative, sometimes interesting about what to do with such uh, uh, fractures in these children. Uh, for this uh, webinar, we wanted to uh, have a balanced uh, team from uh, various backgrounds and various areas in Europe. Professor Virginie Rompal, newly appointed at Nice Lanval Hospital, uh, he's a friend of ours in Lausanne and she also is uh, uh, keen uh, and was educated the French way and French have the plaster as you remember, and I think it would be the, the very good one to speak about the conservative uh, management of uh, proximal humerus fractures. Dorian Schneidmüller is a trauma surgeon. She is German. She comes from the south of Germany and um, uh, has been sharing her experience within the old trauma team for a long time. And uh, she will share her views, maybe convince us that the best way to deal with proximal humerus fracture is to nail them. Uh, we have the chance to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Kyle James, who um, now works in the south of England, uh, I don't know along the sea, but near Brighton. And uh, he is experienced uh, in uh, Australia as well as in Malawi, uh, will give us an insight into the surgical management of distal radius fractures. And uh, Just Kolaris uh, has done a lot of work and a lot of studies, including a thesis on, dis on, on foreign fractures in children. And he will be the one who will uh, also give us the insight uh, from the Netherlands, from uh, Rotterdam, uh, the insight on uh, uh, when and how to uh, deal with the surgical management of distal radius for fractures. So thank you very much to all you four from the faculty. I will now give the, the talk to uh, Professor Rampal. And uh, we will discuss all the questions probably at the end of uh, the four talks. So. So, dear Nicolas, dear organizers, thank you very much for inviting me to participate to this EPOS study group webinar on controversies in pediatric upper limb trauma. So my topic to today, as you said, is uh, proximal humeral fractures as long as conservative treatment is concerned. Um, so I have no conflict of interest. So. Um, to talk about the indication of conservative treatment, I think it's easier to start by talking about the contraindication of orthopedic treatment, actually, since these are clearly established in literature. So absolute indication of surgical treatment are uh, open fractures, fractures uh, threatening the skin, fractures with associated neurovascular problem or intraarticular uh, displacement. Relative contraindication of orthopedic treatment is uh, multiple trauma injuries, associated head trauma or ipsilateral fractures, and particular patients uh, as patients with a cerebral palsy or a neuromuscular disorder because of the unpredictable, uh, unpredictable remodeling due to a disturbed muscle imbalance and also due to the difficulties in nursing of the patient in the event of a prolonged immobilization. That's the same for obesity patients. And finally, severely displaced fracture, which will be the subject of our topic today. So if you consider 
complication of conservative treatment, uh, there are not so frequent and usually mainly relative to shortening of the arm in 9% of cases and persistent angulation at the end of the treatment. That can make some everyday gestures difficult, as you can see on this uh, picture of our young lady trying to remove or put on her, her bra. And um, skin maceration related to immobilization is also a uh, concern when uh, conservative treatment is concerned. Um, another difficulty related to this treatment is the need to carry out regular, regular um, radio, frequent radiographic check, checks on day 7, 14, 21 usually, and the duration of immobilization and the delayed return to activities because proximal fracture should be immobilized, uh, immobilized four to six weeks and as far as shaft fracture are concerned it's more like 12 weeks. Um, finally, the main risk of conservative treatment is the risk of secondary displacement and the need to need surgery. So let's start with metaphysial and epiphysial fractures. So when you talk about this kind of fracture, this should be classified using the near and hour of its classification um, in four types. Types one, type 1 and 2 are minimally displaced uh, fractures, displacement with less than one third of shaft width. And type 3 and 4 are uh, concerned fracture displacement more than one third of shaft width. So type 1 and 2 represent 85% of fractures. And I think that for this kind of fractures, no real discussion um, arise because orthopedic treatment in literature is the gold standard for these slightly displaced fractures. Uh, the question is more for type 3 and 4 fractures with a displacement more than one third of shaft width. Um, and if you go on literature and um, many references, you can see that there is really no mutual agreement, neither on the age, on the cut of age, nor on um, angular displacement, nor on the um, translation uh, cut off. So you can still sketch out a little bit of a course of action, let's say. Before eight years old, you can expect a complete remodeling of the fracture as long as there is a bone contact. Whatever angulation or uh, translation you have. Uh, even in case, in case of when a closed reduction has to be performed, as you can see on this uh, uh, drawing, a conservative treatment can still be recommended afterwards because of the very high potential uh, of remodeling and of the very good um, evolution the patient can have and the patient and the very big, um, large um, capacity to support that kind of treatment. Between eight and 10 years old, uh, 12 years old, when the translation is less than 50% and angulation less than 40 uh, degrees, the orthopedic treatment without re reduction is effective and should, in my mind, should be um, advised. After the age of 12, fractures that can be treated orthopedically are those for which translation is less than 30 degrees and angulation less than 20 degrees, 30% for the translation, excuse me. When the displacement is higher than this cut of values and reduction is required, orthopedic treatment cannot be recommended. In any case, it must be remembered that there must be at least two years of residual growth to be able to hope for any remodeling. Um, quickly, regarding the shaft fractures, there is really no uh, mutual agreement also in literature. Um, it says that uh, surgery is not contraindicated and that non-op treatment is as efficacious as surgical, apart from the length of time of immobilization. So, Non-operative treatment results in excellent outcome, and you really have to remember that in adults, 
30 degrees of angulation and three centimeters of shortening are accepted in case of shaft fracture, as long as there is no malrotation in the fracture site. So in children, few articles concern this shaft fracture, no mutual agreement, of course, but you really should not be more demanding in a kid with a high remodel, remodel, remodel potential than in adults. And so I really think that 30 degrees of angulation and three um, centimeters of shortening with no rotation should be uh, kept as a cutter. So um, finally, what type of immobilization, what kind of immobilization and orthopedic treatment should be used? Uh, there are many, many different types and kinds of splints and orthosis. The simplest one is a sling and quad, um, which has a great advantage of being removable. But I think that every one of you has already seen a kid treated for a fracture, uh, arriving to your outpatient clinic with a sling on the clothes, meaning that the parent takes it off and put it back every time they undress or bath their child. And this is obviously not uh, a sufficient guarantee of fracture stability. So that's why, as a first intention, I think that arm to chest bandage, as we call it Dosso, Dujarrier, Velpo bandage, or whatever name you, you want to call them, um, are more efficient, but they have the disadvantage of making it obviously more difficult to clean the body and to bear for the patient. Um, hanging cast can be an option uh, in case of need of reduction or in shortening in the fracture site, but it's difficult to bear for the patient and it um, most of the time has to be changed um, after a few weeks for a regular ch uh, chest to um, arm to chest bandage. And uh, you have in uh, available in in shops or in the pharmacy, many, many different kinds of orthosis uh, made to prevent various tendency or internal rotation of distal fragment, uh, but they are hardly ever fitting for the children. And thorac thoracobrachial cast with arm abducted is uh, not easy to live with. So, well, in, in my experience and in many of the French um, team experience, our preference go either to the sling and swat when the family has well understood the need to keep it on a night and day basis. And if we fear that the family will remove the sling, then we go to what we call in my town of Nice, we call it a summer du jarrier or a Mayo clinic. And it's often the most effective one to strictly maintain the, any kind of fracture. So uh, to conclude, I would say that before eight years old, orthopedic treatment is recommended in any cases, uh, unle unless of course the uh, absolute contraindication as open fracture or what I said earlier. After 12 years old or in case of less than two years of growth remaining, remaining orthopedic treatment or surgical treatment has to be chosen depending on the displacements. And between 8 and 12 years old, um, the decision has to be made on a case-to-case -case basis, um, based on true age, of course, and also on a patient and family discussion, um, including lifestyle in the decision factor and including uh, sport activities. So, I now leave the floor to... Uh, Dorian Schneidmuller from Germany will tell us about the surgical treatment of these fractures and the discussion will take the place afterwards, I think. Thank you. So, thank you very much. No, that, does it work? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I would like to focus on the surgical management of the proximal humerus fractures, since that was the main topic of this session. Um, just a second, I need to take this. Okay, I have no conflicts of interests. Okay, I'm sorry, I just had a problem here. So yeah, since we, uh, as we just have been demonstrated, because of the great remodeling potential in this area, the conservative treatment is still the treatment of choice. 
or even in older patients, as we can see here in the 12 year old girl, we still can observe some of the remodeling. And here in the younger patient, we see the great remodeling of this complete bionet displacement. So what are now the indications and what fractures require a surgical intervention? We already have heard the indications. The first three, I think, are really rare displaced intraarticular fractures, if I'm honest, I never seen that in a child, open fractures or fractures with associated neurovascular injury. Pathological fractures, uh, they have to be mentioned, they benefit uh, from surgery. And so they say severely displaced fractures in older children and adolescents with limited remodeling potential. But what's now a severe dis displaced fracture? While preparing this talk, I looked up the recent literature for the indications. And as you already heard, some of the authors are using the Nia Horowitz classification and recommend in type 3 and 4 surgery, which is a displacement of more than one third of the shaft width. So what's about the angulation? It always depends on three factors. The age of the child, the remaining growth and the capacity to remodel and the displacement. But this seems to vary greatly in literature. As you already have heard, some authors only tolerate 20 degrees angulations, others up to 70 degrees in, uh, in a child uh, from 10 to 13 years old. So you nearly find everything. So what might be problems which can, we can avoid by surgery? These angulations, especially in skinny patients, may be a cosmetical problem, even if it has no functional limitations. So uh, even if we know this might be temporary in a young child because of the remodeling, this might be not accepted by the patient or the parents. And in older patients, the remodeling might be not enough. Therefore, there is an increase of operative fixation during the last years. Uh, factors which were associated with surgery with the higher age of the children, the displacement, especially the bayonet displacement, a high injury severity score, and interestingly, also if the child was treated in an adult or a children hospital and insurance status. So how do we do it practically? We go into the OR under general anesthesia and I place the uh, child in supine position using an arm table for the injured extremity. I don't use a beach chair position. I place the shoulder in the middle of the table, so I avoid uh, that the metal of the table interferes with our image intensifier. And then I do the reduction. Mostly I can do it in a closed way by traction of the arm, abduction and external rotation. If it doesn't work, I need to open it up via a limited deltopectoral approach. Usually the long head of the biceps tendon is trapped in the fracture gap, but it also can be the capsule, the periosteum, or as you can see here, it's very rare. The shaft is uh, stuck completely through the deltoid muscle. Here you can see a 12 year old girl who fell from a horse with a fracture. And if you can already see such retracted soft tissue, it's likely that you can't achieve a close reduction. Here we had to open it up and remove the soft tissue and the long biceps tendon. So after reduction, what's the best way for fixation? These are the choices we've got. The plate may be an alternative in adolescents with already closed visors. I, I think we don't need it uh, often. Also, the X-fix is rare. So that leaves us the K-wire pinning and the retrograde is in. Interestingly, even in nearly talk I listen to, or especially in the courses, the ASIN technique is a recommended technique of choice. But uh, still, the K-wire pinning seems to be the most common way to do it in reality. So how do we do it? We are using two or three K wires, smooth or threaded, insert them in a divergent uh, direction into the head. The entry point should be around the insertion of the deltoid muscle to avoid an axillary nerve injury, which passes the humerus approximately five centimeter distally uh, from the lateral acromion. If you're using smooth K wires, some authors leave them epicontaneously that allows an implant removal without a secondary anesthesia. So what are the problems? Complications can be the perforation of the head, as you can see here, 
but most often it's the soft tissue irritation, muscle irritation, like the deltoid muscle or rotator cuff infection, pin migration. I think the main drawback is uh, the limited stabilization. It needs an additional immobilization by Gilchrist or according to some authors, even a shoulder abduction immobilizer. Therefore, I think this technique is losing ground nowadays to the ASIN. Some authors are um, reporting such a modified technique like an X-fix to increase stability. Even if this doesn't need an additional immobilization, I don't believe a really early mobilization is possible because of the soft tissue irritation. I just have read an um, article submission from China where they reported a pin technique cemented with bone cement. Um, I to me, in these fractures, in this age, this goes uh, much too far. So this is a comparison between the ASIN technique and the K-wire pinning, and this showed that the ASIN technique showed better reduction results in the final radiographs. It allows early mobilization and showed less complications like infection, soft tissue irritation, axial nerve injury, or pin migration. On the other hand, it had a higher estimated blood loss, a longer surgical time, and for sure it needs a secondary anesthesia for implant removal. You remember the girl who fell from a horse? Here I performed the limited open reduction to remove the soft tissue on the long biceps tendon and fixed it that way, which allowed an early mobilization. Another case of a pathological fracture in the juvenile bone cyst. Here the ASIN doesn't only provide the uh, fracture stabilization, it also leads to a permanent decompression of the cyst, which improves healing. There are several studies which report an overall good result after this technique with a low complication rate. So how do we do it? We are using two nails of the same diameter, approximately one third of the intramedullary canal. We pre-bend the nails. The approach should be approximately one centimeter above the prominence of the lateral condyle. We are using two entry points at the lateral uh, distal metaphysis. Then we can advance the nails into the shaft to the proximal part. And as you can see here, the tips are pointed to the lateral cortex. And now we can rotate one of the nails uh, about 180 degrees. So now we've got the tips pointed in a divergent direction. And then we do our reduction as we know it. And then we can advance one of the nails into the head. And by rotating the nail, we maybe can achieve a little correction of our reduction result. And if we are satisfied, we can advance the second nail into the head. We are allowed to perforate the physis it's the, the most stable part of the head to increase stability. At the end, we have to make sure that the nail tips are in a divergent position and we have to exclude perforation of the nails under the image intensifier. For sure, there are also some failures, um, usually technical failures, and this 13-year-old uh, boy showed several of them. Um, I think in a 13-year-old boy, it's no discussion that we have to fix that fracture. But if you look closely, now it looks good, but if you look closely, you can see here the primary entry points. And if you're choosing the wrong entry point, which is usually too high, you can see it here at the scars over there. Um, this carries a high risk for radial nerve injury, and this boy had a radial nerve injury. Um, you also can see here the corkscrew phenomenon, which decreases stability. And after five months, we didn't see a healing, which is really rare That's in that region. Um, I suppose it's because of the extended open reduction and the blocking phenomenon of the uh, nails. One nail already perforated the head, so I just removed the nails and now it showed the proper healing and luckily also the radial nerve showed a full recovery. So let me summarize. The operative treatment should be considered in older patients with severe displacement and limited remodeling potential. I'm afraid I can't give you an exact grade of the displacement which we can tolerate because there's no evidence for this now. So we have to have a, a, a personal decision in every case. The treatment of choice is clearly for me the easing technique. 
because it shows less complications, it allows early mobilization, and the reported longer operation time, I think we can decrease just by more experience with this technique. Thank you very much from Monau. And now we move on to the distal radius and I give the talk to Dr. James. Okay, hey, so um, the distal radius is really the most common fracture that we see in a, in a child. It accounts for one in four fractures. But despite this being so common, there's still a lack of robust clinical evidence on what the best treatment is for these injuries. And as a result, we see a large variation in clinical practice. Some people are treating it with a simple splint. Some people are using a plaster cast. Some people uh, perform a closed reduction in the emergency department or take them Dr. to the operating, operating theater. Dr. James, unfortunately, there is some issue with the PowerPoint. Would you mind starting from the beginning? So closing and starting again, because we can see only a white screen, please. Can you confirm you can see this? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. My apologies. Apologies for that technical. So, as as we previously said, uh, this is the most common fracture we see in children, accounting for one in four fractures. But there's a lack of robust clinical evidence guiding treatment. And to, today, there's still a large variation in treatment, where some surgeons treating it with just a simple splint some using a cast, whether below elbow or above elbow, some having a closed reduction, and some going to the operating theatre and using internal fixation. We know that this is more common in boys than girls. Um, a third of them seem to be as a result of a high energy fall, greater than standing height, and a third are due to sports. When we look to the fracture pattern, the majority are buckle or torus fractures is often an associated ulnar fracture in half of these injuries. Growth plate injuries account for one in five, and by far the most common type is the Salter-Harris II fracture. As you can see, having an open fracture or presented with neurological or vascular symptoms is extremely rare. When we look at growth plate injuries, we see that these happen in a slightly older child over the age of uh, 11. However, the majority of these injuries are totally undisplaced and require no reduction and simple casting or splinting. A third of them need some form of closed reduction, whether on the conscious sedation in the emergency department or being taken to the operating room. Only 3% overall undergo surgical fixation, and there's an estimated 7% complication rate. So the majority of these, 97%, will be managed conservatively. If we do a close reduction or take the child to the operating theater, that increases the cost by about 50% to up to 700%. So what we know is that children's fractures remodel, and that's due to periosteal bone formation, the physis realigning, or by bone being laid down where it's needed and removed where it isn't. As was mentioned, the most important factor governing modeling is the age of the patient. And the younger they are, the better it is. The cutoff is that they should have two years more of remodeling, for two years more of growth for a fracture to remodel. Other factors that are very favorable is the closer it is to the growth plate, the better the chance of remodeling, and whether the displacement is in the plane of motion of the joint. Particularly for the distal radius, we know this accounts for the majority of growth of the radius, so it has the highest percentage of uh, highest chance of remodeling. When we look at clinical studies of remodeling, the majority happens in the first six months. 
It then continues up to two years, uh, but it plateaus over this time. Clinical studies have generated a mathematical model for us to try and predict the rate of remodeling, and that's called the Freiburg's equation, which you can see in this table on the right. However, with severely displaced fractures, even after two years, there may still be a mild residual deformity. What we don't know, and that's the highlighted uh, deformity, what we don't know is whether or not this will lead to any clinical difference or functional difference long term. Also, it's important to know that many studies looking at remodeling use age 11 or 11 years old as a cutoff. And you can see from the chart in the middle on the bottom that this is well before the two years of remaining growth, which are the shaded areas for boys and girls. So the best evidence we have for managing uh, distal radius fractures is for the torus or buccal fracture, which is the most common type we see. Uh, last year, the four study published results of about a thousand, nearly a thousand children who were randomized into a bandage and immediate discharge or those who had a splinter cast and follow-up. What was really interesting is that there was no difference in pain score between bandage or splinting, and there was no difference in uh, time to recovery, complication rates, or quality of life uh, um, outcomes. When we look at bandaging, it actually saved about 14 euros per patient, which was a, is going to be a significant saving because 60, we see 60,000 of these fractures a year in the UK alone. I would definitely recommend you go to the four study webpage, which has useful information for you to use this in your clinical practice. Now, the controversy really uh, goes around displaced fractures of the distal radius, whether these are off-ended fractures, growth plate injuries, or angulated green stick fractures. There's a growing body of evidence that it's probably safe in under 11 years of age to allow these fractures to heal naturally. What is unknown is what the best, um, what a cutoff is for acceptance. Conservatively, most people use less than 30 degrees angulation, less than 50% of physial translation, or up to a centimeter of overlap. But this certainly isn't evidence-based. And right now, the craft study is undergoing, looking at this specific cohort of children comparing surgical treatment and non-surgical treatment of uh, distal radius fractures under the age of 11. And hopefully this will give us a clear idea of the uh, degrees of acceptance we should have. And we hope to have those results in the next year to two years. The gray area, however, remains in the over 11. And still the majority of these children are treated with some form of uh, closed reduction that's either on a conscious station in the emergency department or in the operating room if they need internal fixation. We know the majority of these can be managed successfully in the emergency department with uh, conscious sedation. But sedation and surgery increases the time of the patient in the hospital and the cost. If you do come to reduce a fracture, I'd like to give you a few principles. I say this is my ABC approach. So for green stick fractures, we try to align them by overcorrecting the fracture to complete it and then putting them in a plaster. For off-ended fractures, we need to hyperextend the fracture then by bending the wrist and then walking it over to reduce. This is obviously much sore and is often best done on the general anesthetic. Finally, we need to put on a cast and a below elbow well-molded cast is appropriate with a three-point mold. We try to aim for an oval cross-section to increase the interosseous space, and we look for a cast index on x-ray of less than 0.8. But saying all this, we do see that some of these factors redisplace, and that slippage rate is between 25 to 40%. We know kids who have off-ended fractures, who have fractures of both bones, and where the fracture is not fully reduced, with a high cast index are most at risk of redisplacement. So if you have a closed reduction, uh, we recommend you're seen within a week, a check x-ray to make sure this hasn't redisplaced. The good news is the majority of these can be managed 
with cast wedging. 95% of redisplacements can be managed with simple cast wedging in the outpatient clinic rather than a return to the operating theatre. When we look at growth plate injuries, um, the, the best uh, advice is really summarised with practice presenting later than five days, or if they've slipped and then present after five days, we would probably advise not to do a repeat reduction. Late presenting a redisplacement and another attempted reduction can cause physal injury in up to 70%. We, we feel that Salter Harris three and four fractures, which involve an intraarticular split, should go to the operating theater for operative fixation if there's a gap or a step that's clearly obvious on the x-ray. As previously mentioned, Salter Harris two fractures less than 50% with more than two years of growth can most likely be allowed to heal naturally. And we'll have more evidence of this following the craft study. The main concern about physical injuries are growth rest. This is not particularly common, but it is seen in any type of distal radius fractures, including Salter Harris II fractures. So if you are worried that a fracture mechanism is at risk of growth arrest, a repeat X-ray at six months is advised to monitor for this. But the good news is the long-term outcome of growth disturbance is actually very favorable. A 25-year follow-up study on Visual fractures in children show that radial shortening of less than a centimeter, ulnar shortening of up to three and a half centimeters, and any styloid nonunion were asymptomatic. And most of these children had no symptoms at maturity after 25 years. Now, what about open fractures? Well, there's a growing body of evidence that support uh, conservative management for grade one fractures. These are puncture wounds. Uh, in a clean area. This can be managed with irrigation in the emergency department, intravenous antibiotics for 24 to 36 hours, and a plaster with a window to assess the wound. This results in an overall deep infection rate of 2%. More contaminated or uh, severe open fractures require operative debridement. If you have a neurological or vascular symptoms, which are extremely rare, the recommendation is to reduce these injuries in emergency department setting, splint and then reassess. The majority of these will still be suitable for conservative management. So in summary, I feel the future is looking bright for the distal radius fracture. The four studies have actually given us the best evidence and we've got a craft study to come. We can say safely that torus fractures can be managed with a bandage um, and discharged from the emergency department. Most likely on the 11 year olds uh, with displaced fractures can be managed with simple splintage. And we await the, the results of craft study to uh, confirm the acceptability criteria. For children over 11, they still will need a close reduction under some sort of conscious sedation. And most of these can happen in the emergency department. And some will need to go to the operating theater for internal fixation. Thank you very much. I'd like to now hand over to Dr. Kolaris, who's going to speak about surgical management. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I will talk about the surgical management of distal radius fractures. So imagine next month you will be on winter holiday with some other families and the conditions are perfect. Suddenly you look back and there's a scream. And this child is crying, sitting in the snow and his arm looks like this. So the x-rays made in the emergency department looks like a distal bow bone uh, fracture which is displaced. And everyone is pointing at you because you are the expert, so you know what to do. So the child is brought to the, uh, the OR and the fracture is reduced by closed means. After reduction, an X-ray is taken 
And with a little bit of luck, I pick his post on Insta. After four weeks, unfortunately, the fracture has uh, this has been displaced and it's not really looking nice on the x-rays on the right side. And if we remove the cast, the wrist looks like this. And his mom becomes mad. Then we tell her that there are natural remedies so that the growth is normally our friend in children and that it will remodel in coming years. Then that becomes mad as well. A few years in angulated arm is not what he wishes. So a distal displaced fracture, which is apparent stable in the OR, should we not fixate these with directly with K wires to prevent displacement? So for that reason, we set up several uh, multicenter RCTs with inclusion of four and ten children, and this is the one we are talking about: apparent stable distal fractures. So I wrote a thesis about this with seven months of follow-up. So the distal displaced fractures, which are apparent stable uh, during uh, Operation Theater, should we fix these fractures with K-wires or not? So we did an RCT with inclusion of 128 children, and half the group get only got the only cast, and other one, other half K-wires in cast. And after a follow-up follow of seven months, we found that without K-wires, we saw more redisplacement, 45 versus 8 percent. And furthermore, less prone supination in a group without K-wires after seven months. So that made us advice that if you go to the R and to, to uh, reduce the fracture, please fixate the fracture with K-wires to prevent another time to go to the R if displacement occurs. So it's not only my study, but there are several reviews and meta-analysis. And there are two in favor of K-wires and one in favor of PLAST. So who is at risk for redisplacement of the fracture in cast? In summary, a severe fracture with a non-anatomical reduction and a non-dominant arm involved. So this is just a minimal displaced fracture. And even these fractures can be uh, apparently unstable. So if will children develop impaired rotation after a wrist fracture? Most doctors will tell there will be no impaired rotation in distal fractures. But we showed that if there is a malunion up to 15 degrees, it's okay. It's only 30, 13 degrees, 13% 13 of impaired rotation. But above 15, so more than 16 degrees of malunion after seven months, there will be a 60% chance of impaired rotation. So the K, these K-wires, is it that much invasive? So this is a displaced fracture in the OR. We reduce it by closed means, and we drill the K-wire. We bend it and cut it, and we do it another time. It's minimally invasive, and we just remove the K-wires in the outpatient clinic. So what about the boy who was crying? with his arm looks like a banana. What about the natural remedies? We talked about that the growth will be our friend. So for that reason, we also did the seven years of follow-up. So again, the seven years follow-up of the distal displaced fractures showed that we had 82% of follow-up and we found no significant difference in rotation, prompts or angulation between the two groups or of cast or K wires. But we found that the male union still had a high risk for impaired rotation with an odds ratio of 5.2. So that made us believe that we should change our uh, policy a little bit. So we have a distal fracture which is displaced. And if we reduce it in the OR, please use K wires uh, to prevent redisplacement and uh, prevent another time going to OR. If you do the reduction in the emergency room, please 
make weekly an X-ray to see if there is displacement. And if displacement occurs, go to the OR and put KYs inside to stabilize it. But what kind of complications do we see in KYS, using KYS? First of all, in, in favor of the KYS, there was the redisplacement, 45 versus 4%. The general complications are similar in between the groups. But of course, there are more complications by using KYS, 11% of problems. What we learned is don't cut the KYs too short. If you cut them too short, they will move subcutaneously and you should go to R to remove them. Furthermore, we saw male position of KYs. Please do not cross these KYs in the fracture because it, it becomes less stable. This is not a case, it's really um, a rare complication. This displaced fracture is fixed with K wires and osteomyelitis uh, occurs. So we, we opened it up, debrided it, uh, gave antibiotics for six weeks. Finally, it ended up with a malunion, which was corrected by a corrective osteotomy with 3D moles, the guides. So what about our holiday in, um, in the snow? The child was crying, his parents became mad because his arm looked like a banana. There was a problem of prone supination, especially supination deficit on the right side. And severe preoperatively instability of the distal radial ulnar joint. So we use the 3D guides and models to correct it. And after surgery, it looks quite good, I think. It's almost similar as the model. And the instability of the distal joint is solved. So should we always talk about black and white as in a zebra? Now, I think there's also a grayscale. So what I would advise, if we do a reduction in the emergency room, there's no problem with that. But please uh, check it by radiographs weekly to see if there's any displacement. If you go to the OR and reduce the fracture in the OR, please use K-wires because you don't want to come back in the OR because of displacement. Who is at risk for displacement? severe fractures, non-anatomical reductions in a non-dominant arm. And there's correction by growth in young children with minimal inoculation in the second plane as most. And if there is a complications uh, such as a null union, we can solve it. And if you like to do these kind of procedures, please contact me. Maybe we can do some research together. Thank you very much for the attention. Well, thank you very much, dear colleagues, for your input. And uh, as I was listening to all of you, I thought I think we need a, an hour and a half to discuss all the issues and all the points that you that you raised. Um, I would start uh, with a few questions um, that actually will go to the four of you because the, you mentioned these two years of growth remaining. And I would uh, just in a few words have an answer from each of you on how do you decide and how do you measure this? Virginie, how do you know if a child has two years of growth remaining? Well, I'd say, honestly, I think uh, experience is the key point at this this time. Well, you can rely a little bit on age, uh, calendar age, I mean, uh, considering that on the upper limb, uh, the growth is, uh, is one of the, the, the longest one to go. But um, 
usually after 12 years old, it's difficult to think that two years can be really sure. Two, two, remaining, two years of remaining growth is sure. So after 12 years, I think it's difficult. And sometimes you, you get, you, 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 you face kids, uh, especially girls, like young girls of 11 or 12, which are already very tall and with the puberty signs, like obvious. And so you can think that they don't have that much growth to come uh, still. But I think it's really experience with the taking care of kids. It's difficult for the youngest, obviously. Dorian Schneidmüller, what would you say about this assessment of the two years remaining growth? It's hard, but uh, I think we, ha we have to look for the maturity, um, the bone, the bone age, and the maturity of the child. So there are uh, 11 years old girls from from Italy, which are nearly finished, <laughs> and uh, 11 years old girl from Norway, uh, which have I don't know four years of growth remaining. So you have to look at the child and not only at the age on the X-ray. So I think. Under the age of 10, everything is safe, completely safe, and then you have to look at the child. Okay, Dr. James. So I guess uh, for girls, I will ask when they started the menstrual cycle. Um, if they haven't started their menstrual cycle, I'm pretty happy that they probably have more than two years remaining. But it's the gray areas, the child, which you think is too close to that two years. And if I really am concerned that I'm not going to just bite the bullet and say, let's take them to theatre and sort it out, I'm going to run with this conservatively, but I'm concerned, you can do a left hand PA x ray and do a bone age. That's quite simple for us to do in our, our institution. We can just send them down for an x ray of the hand to check their bone age if I'm concerned. Okay, Njost, Coloris, how would you do? Uh, most most things are said already, of course, but the clinical appearance is uh, where I'm looking at, mostly. Okay. Well, it's interesting. So, so you see, for a simple question, which is, uh, well, how much growth remaining there is in two years is the uh, usual number that comes out. You use the clinical, the assessment of the child. You may use the bone age. Uh, do you sometimes assess the fracture site, and the, uh, you also sometimes look at the at the growth plate for the distal radius? And does any of you use a computer or a, a little web-based um, program? Because they are on the market. Some of them are quite reliable. Any of you has any experience with those? No, I tend to use just the uh, bone age if I was yeah, that concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Nicholas, uh, in the meantime, we have a question uh, from the audience. And the question is that there, um, they say that the metaphysial diaphysial junction fracture might be a real problem and not uh, the distal radius fracture. So maybe we can ask Kyle James, uh, can you maybe respond on this question? Sure. So I, I think. Uh, Juice and I both agree that you have to assess whether or not you think this is an unstable fracture pattern that may not uh, be suitable for closed reduction. Um, but if you do reduce them, the first thing, um, and you're happy with your reduction and they don't slip and they heal, I still mobilize them at six weeks, but I do warn the parents not to return to sports for three months because there's a refracture risk of one in 10. Or some, so these kids, you can't just let them get back to everything or they'll come back in with another injury. So the metaphyseal diaphyseal junction is quite a special injury to remember that we have to hold them back from doing their sports and so on for a longer time. And do you agree, Joost, uh, with this? I do agree, and, and but I think sometimes you are not able to use the cross K wires in, this cases, in these cases. And sometimes it's very hard to to, to penetrate the, uh, the opposite cortex. So you probably uh, it's able to use the, uh, the internal medullary nails in this junction uh, type of fractures. This, sometimes it's more easy, but it's, it can be a challenge anyway, these kind of fractures. Um, I would like to 
ask the audience to give us some more questions. Um, in the meantime, uh, Nicolas, do you want to ask another question, or otherwise I can ask yes, some? I think I think we can focus a little bit on the distal forearm and then go back to the proximal humerus. With regards to the distal forearm, it was interesting yes, to see that in your studies, uh, the non-dominant arm seems to be uh, more prone to uh, late displacement or in displacement, if I understand well. Could you could you comment on this and 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 explain why? It is very difficult to explain, but what we discussed is that maybe the less developed muscles around the arm in the in the non-dominant arm can be the reason that there's a less of envelope of muscles muscles to stabilize the fracture. That's what we thought about. And that leads me to uh, Kyle and and your uh, preference with regards to the material for casting a distal uh, radius fracture. Is it, in your experience, more convenient to mold uh, properly a cast with plaster of Paris or the now available and very used uh, synthetic casts are fit for this purpose? I think you have to decide what you have in your hospital. We use synth synthetic casts at our hospital and we get a very good mold uh, with that. Um, sometimes in the emergency department setting, they use mainly plus of Paris because that's what they have, and that also works well. So it really depends. The most important thing is to try and do that plus with a good three point mold, get an oval cross section, and uh, make sure you have uh, a good reduction. Yeah, so I think, um, yeah. Do you, do you feel that the cat, the, the wedge? Uh, the cast wedging, which you mentioned, is uh, dif more difficult with synthetic cast uh, material? Not at all. Probably a bit easier um, with the synthetic material. We do put a, a plaster, we use plaster Paris to bridge the gap and then go over again with synthetic wedge because, you know, we don't have that many corks in the hospital, so we use plaster Paris as a wedge. <laughs> okay. Thank you I very much. I have a question uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, they ask, which entry point do you prefer for retrograde ASIN for proximal humeral fractures? Maybe we can ask Doreen this. Yeah, I showed a picture. Um, it should be at the distal metaphysis on the lateral part. So um, both nails are inserted from the lateral part. And you do the approach um, over the prominence of the lateral condyle to proximally. Um, and you need to have two entry points. So it's um, not working if you're just using one big entry point. So you have to use two entry points. Um, and then, yeah, at the distal lateral metaphysis, not too high because of the uh, radial nerve, which is close. Have you experienced Dorin with only one nail? Uh, no, if I'm honest, not. But I know that some of the colleagues, and I think there are also some um, some studies, um, are doing just one nail. Um, yeah, with this remodeling potential, um, some of the redisplacement I think we can tolerate. So it it may work. But if it's stable enough for early mo mobilization, I don't know. I don't have any experience with it. We should finish with one question for the audience uh, who comes in, uh, Melinda, as you see. Uh, how do you decide in the OR if a fracture is unstable once reduced? Let's, um, Virginie, what do you, wh how do you decide if the fracture is unstable once you've reduced it? Uh, if, first, I think if I have difficulties in uh, uh, getting to a good reduction with a pr um, sufficient re reduction. I, I think that uh, the, um, when the reduction is difficult to obtain, then the risk of a displacement is high. And uh, then I, I try to slightly move and to uh, only when doing the x-ray, you know, the AP and lateral view x-ray, sometimes you have the fracture is moving a little bit and you really think that you have to get a, um, uh, to put the, the wrist, by example, in a, in a extreme position, like 
flexion or extension or with a lot of radial or uh, ulnar inclination uh, and that that is a risk of displacement i think more at risk so uh, combined with the age of the patient and um, maybe uh, uh, with the swelling of the wrist or of the, um, the, the limb then you can think that um, the stability will be a little bit Okay, so you test it in the OR, you, you, you assess your difficulty in reducing the fracture, and then you decide if it stays once tested in the OR under radiological uh, guidance. Any comments from the other experts with regards to stability, Jost? Yeah, about the disoforum fractures and also on the mid shaft fractures, uh, after uh, reduction by closed means, um, I passively rotate the uh, forearm of the child and hold the arm proximal to the fracture. So first reduce it and then hold the arm proximal to the fracture side and rotate it passively. And if it stays in place, it's stable. And if not, it's unstable. And even if it's stable, and that was a study I showed with the 128 children, these fractures were all apparent stable because the unstable ones were already pinned. So, and then still 45%, which were apparent stable, were not stable. Um, Nicolas, I think there's another last uh, interesting question. I think we might still have a bit. Um, yeah, they're starting to come up all the questions. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so how often have you all seen a significant distal radio ulnar stability? Uh, what needed surgery later to correct this? Uh, you, you showed it, Joost, but did uh, all of the other ones uh, see it as well? No. I, I, I think it's rare. I think it's rare. But, yeah. I, I had... Uh, Two, two, two or three with the growth arrest, um, which we had to correct. But otherwise, I always recommend uh, when we have a, a malalignment about 40 degrees or something like that, which you really can see the banana, <laughs> uh, then we just wait. And usually it corrects until it's not seen anymore, at least clinically. And they usually don't have any restrictions, but um, it's, it's interesting the the rotational um, uh, the prosupination deficits that they showed. I think we have to look at this a little more closely. Definitely. Another question comes with regards to the position of the forearm when you reduce and cast. Uh, better to have uh, pronation, supination, uh, ulnar inclination. Kyle, a comment on this? I think the majority of the distal radius can be managed with a below elbow cast. So I'm not too worried in about neutral, this. In neutral yeah, position? In neutral, or yeah. do you think there is any sense or any um, any uh, advantage in, in, in using complete pronation and I guess wrist? you can only do that with an above elbow. If you're concerned about that, I think if you're that concerned about the stability, as you says, you should be thinking in the operating theatre, do I need to put a wire in? Yeah. If you have to do these special maneuvers, it's probably a very unstable fracture and it's going to slip within a week. So if they're in the OR, be ready for a, a internal fixation. And there's another one. Um, uh, do you always uh, completely break a green stick fracture of the radius or ulna? I guess that depends where you're doing it. In the emergency department, um, uh, I would say most of those aren't done by orthopedic surgeons. It's done by emergency department technicians, and not all of them are pushed uh, to that extent. Um, some, you know, most green stick fractures that you'll see are still minimally angulated. Um, if you have one that you're taking to the operating theater or you're doing yourself in the emergency department, when you get a reduction, you usually have a click. And that stops it springing back in, a, in the plaster and seeing late displacement. So it's important to try and reduce that late displacement. The other three, do you break? Uh, maybe yes and no hand, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we'll break. 
another come another question comes with the um, the timing to reduction sort of late presentation. Kyle, you mentioned the issue of of, of late manipulation with the risk of growth arrest. Uh, Dorian, do you think there is any risk uh, for the proximal humerus if a child presents uh, a few days, uh, if not a week, and then you decide to reduce? And um, nail? I don't. I don't think there. There. I don't know. I don't know about uh, the increased risk for growth arrest if we do it lately. We know in the um, Salton Harris uh, one and two at the lower extremity that there is a higher risk. I don't know about it at the proximal humerus, but. Um, because of the great remodeling potential, if they are presenting late, okay. I'm always tend to to wait uh, what the remodeling can do. And uh, I've never done a correction osteotomy at the proximal humerus, so it never was needed. Um, and no one case which will is always presented <laughs> as a as an example, but it's always the same case. So I, I don't I really know only one case where we had to do it. So I, I to your question, I don't know. And you mentioned the early mobilization. What is early for you? Does it mean you don't put any sling and leave the child going out with? Yeah. yeah. The okay. child leaves without any immobilization, the OR, and uh, depending on the swelling and the hematoma, if the if the child has a lot of pain, I just give them a sling for a few days, but they are allowed to remove the arm from the sling. Um, I, I test uh, the stability in the OR, and after the ASIN, it should be stable enough to move it. I think, Melinda, we will give you the last word for this <laughs> session, which has been very intense and uh, gave us a lot of information on on actually two simple questions for two fractures that are very common and dealt in, in various ways. I appreciate very much the uh, effort of, of sensitizing and, and focusing on new subjects for each of the talks. Thank you very much. Melinda, the voice is yours. Uh, okay, I would like to thank all the attendees. Uh, uh, there are about 106, so that's fantastic uh, to see that there's so many uh, people listening to this webinar. And of course, I would like uh, to thank the organizers, but most of all, I would like to thank Joost, Kyle, Doreen and Virginie for their excellent talks. And uh, I've learned a lot again as well. Um, Thank you very much again, and hopefully we see all each other again in Krakow. Anything else, Nicolas? No, Otherwise thank you. The, the, the webinar goodbye. will be the webinar will be um, uh, online in the next days, and for whoever wants to uh, see it back and see some of the uh, very interesting studies which have been mentioned, and I encourage you because in all the four talks there were very good basic studies which bring us back to the basics most of the time um, with regards to the these fractures in children so thank you again to the participants to the to the, the floor and the speakers uh, and to the organizing uh, team from the EPOS thank you bye-bye bye-bye